bless you. Welcome to Bible study. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. A bunch of believers who are crazy about Jesus. We have no apologies for that. We study scriptures verse by verse because the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. And we believe that no one buys a book and jumps about the chapters, paragraphs, and the sentences in it. But you read from start to finish, that way you're able to understand the contents of the book and hopefully the mind of the author. And since we've been doing that, we've experienced tremendous growth, experienced a shift in our prayer lives because we pray from a place of understanding and knowledge now. We pray pointed prayers and we get results because God is a God answers prayer. This is our second go around studying uh, scriptures. We started on the 1st of June, we completed the book of Genesis and the book of Exodus, and we're about midway into the book of Leviticus. And uh, it's, just, it's just amazing what Jesus has done for us in the New Testament. Glory to God. Uh, we stopped at chapter 15 yesterday. We're going to pick it up on chapter 16 today. And I hope you are ready. So, Father, thank you for the awesome privilege of being able to come before the very presence of the God of heaven, the God who created everything that was and is. What a privilege to be called sons of Almighty God. What an honor to know you as intimately as we do. And our hearts still yearn to know you more. We ask that you will breathe upon your word, cause it to come alive in us, to change us, to instruct us, to guide us, to establish us, that men may see us and give glory to you, our Father, who is in heaven. Thank you, Spirit of Grace. You are the blessed teacher. Open the eyes of our understanding. Show us the truths that are hid in the word of God. And cause our hearts to lean towards understanding. In Jesus' name we pray for thanksgiving. Amen and amen. Leviticus chapter 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. The Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the measure seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with the linen girdle and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. For the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the, bull, the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord. And his hands full of sweet incense, beating small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat 
from the testimony that he die not. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering, that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place till he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. When he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions in all their sins putting them upon the head of the goat. I shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. The goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering, which he burned upon the altar, and he that let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp. And they shall burn in the fire their skins and their flesh and their dung. And he that burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp. This shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. On that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by statute forever. And the priest whom he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make the atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Praise God. Again, uh, if you understand the new testament and what jesus did you can see that all of these that we just read in chapter 16 are types and shadows of the lord jesus christ who is the perfect sacrifice perfect lamb, lamb of god that was slain for the remission of our sins in the old testament it talks about atonement and to atone for sin is to request that god look away that's all it does. It doesn't remove sin. That's why they have to keep doing it over and over and over and over again. Every time they sinned, they had to do it. Whether they sinned or not, they had to do it. But in the New Testament, glory to God, 
Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. And it was done just for one time. And its effect and its power is for all eternity. He doesn't have to die over and over and over and over again. Just like they had to slay uh, all these animals over and over and over again. That's why the Bible says when you sin, it's like you crucify the Lord all over again. Because what you imply by committing sin again and again is that the blood that he shed is not adequate. That's what you're saying every time that you sin. I do believe that when you understand the implications of some of these things, to stop sinning will not be a challenge. That's why I can tell you with all humility that I do not sin. I don't craft sin and commit it. I don't do it. And it's because of the clear understanding of the word of God that I know. Now, do I still sin? Yes. Because I'm in the flesh. And there's no good thing in the flesh. And I still inadvertently sin. I still think or say stuff before I am corrected by the Spirit of God. And immediately, short accounts, I say, Lord, I'm sorry. And I never should have said that. It's like the, the, the experience I shared with you a few weeks ago. This trailer was trying to, this huge truck, like uh, it wasn't an 18 wheeler, but it wasn't your regular truck because I think it had two or three axles, right? And in the median, there were trees planted such that if you wanted to pull in to make a left turn, you couldn't see the vehicles that were coming. So the driver of the truck had to pull into the uh, right-hand side lane that I was on, and he blocked my lane so that he could see to be able to pull out and make that left turn. I hope you understand what I'm describing. And I pulled up to him, and I did one of these. Implying what's the sense in what you're doing, blocking the lane. I did see the trees. I know from driving, from experience, that you cannot engage that left turn unless you pull out to be able to look. But my flesh had did this, and in my mind, I had called him stupid or foolish or whatever I said. I don't remember because I confessed the sin. And he has blocked out that transgression. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was horrible. And immediately the Spirit of God said, mm, Pastor. And I felt so rotten. And I told God, I said, Lord, never again. And I mean it. Never again. In my stupidity, how do I know that that guy driving the truck is not a child of God? How do I know that he's not even a pastor who is bivocational? Drives a truck to make extra money because being a pastor, how much do you make? How much do you earn? How much do I earn from pastoring? Zero. And I, I, I was, I felt so horrible. So we still inadvertently sin because as long as we're in this flesh, we'll do stupid things. We'll do foolish things. But to sit down and know that God has said, thou shalt not concerning something, I will die first. And you have to come to that place, child of God, where it is, it is God, God, God or God. And after that, it will be God or God. You've got to come to that place because his blood, the, the, his blood, the efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That's why you can't keep doing the same things. You cannot. You cannot. Know someone who wants to get married so desperately. And you should see the stuff they post. Eve didn't parade herself. Eve did not parade herself. God took her 
to him. And if you trust God, he will take you to the man that he has for you. You can't choose a husband by yourself. And you cannot choose a wife by yourself. Look around you at all the people who chose. And tell me how many are successful. If you say God is your father, trust him. I don't care if you are in the hole. That man will find you because God will bring you to him. And I've told you finding doesn't mean the man is looking. Adam was asleep. He wasn't looking. That scripture that says when a man finds a wife is talking about when a man recognizes. It's not talking about finding because he's all over the place searching. No. Many women come into his life. But when he finds his wife, he knows. There's nothing any other female has that interests him. He's found the one. Talking to a gentleman a few months ago, he said, Pastor Mo, when you know, you know. You cannot continue in sin. You can't. You cannot. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 14, verse 40. Help me. He says, do all things decently and in order. It's not decent to wear some of the stuff that these designers are designing and selling in the store. Decently. Do all things decently and in order. It's the word. Is that reference right, Don? Yes, ma'am. First Corinthians 14, 40. Thank you. I don't know how I got off on that tangent, but someone needed to hear it. The Lord spoke to Moses after Aaron's two sons died, the ones that went to burn strange fires before the Lord. He said to tell Aaron, don't just come in my presence willy-nilly because you're the high priest. Don't just come before me anyhow. I shared with you the morning my mother died. I knew because the Lord let me know she would go on that day. And the Lord said to me, Go and administer Holy Communion. Because I know from experience in ministry that when someone is at the point of death, when you administer Holy Communion, it separates the spirit from the body. And they leave. So when he told me to go and administer the Holy Communion, I knew that my mother would not see the end of that day. I went into my room picked up the kit, the traveling kit that had the, the, the wafer and whatever, a small kit for traveling ministers. I have one right here. And I proceeded to go into her room. There was an adjoining door between her bedroom and mine. And the Lord said to me, appear before me properly. I wasn't wearing a negligee. I wasn't wearing anything sexy or, or flimsy or, or, or transparent. I sleep in, in, in sometimes in something as thick as this. And I had to go back, take off my pajamas and put on a dress and put my stole on my neck and then go into my mother's room. He said, appear before me properly. God is not our body. He's not. He's God Almighty. Says, don't come before me just anyhow that you like. I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. And no man can see me and live. He has already said that. So if you show up in that place with sin on your on your on your on your life, or in your life, 
you will just die. Do the needful. Come and, and do this the sin offering. Come and give the sacrifice of the sin offering so that you're, you're covered before you come before my presence. These are types and shadows. And you and I that are born again children of Almighty God, we cannot do any less. We cannot take the grace and the mercy of God for granted and just live any which way that we want to live. This country does not understand the concept of liberty. Liberty is not freedom to do as you like. No. Liberty without responsibility is extremely dangerous. It says, tell Aaron when he's coming before me, he should come with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for the burnt offering. I told you the spirit realm is transactional. Both the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. The spirit realm is transactional. If you do this, I will do this. If you don't do this, I won't do this. Same thing with the devil. Both God and Satan live in the spirit world. And it's a transactional world. Nothing goes for nothing. says he must, he must appear before me properly. He must put on the holy linen coat. He will have the linen breeches upon his flesh so that his nakedness is not uncovered. All right? He shall be girded with a linen girdle. He shall put on the linen mitre. He shall be attired in holy garments. God is a proper God. And until we begin to honor him and respect him. He shall wash his flesh in water and then put them on. All of these are types and shadows. Today in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work of sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which the Spirit of God causes you to remain holy. But it's predicated upon your consent and your cooperation. God cannot force you to be holy. He's commanded you to be holy. He said, be ye holy as I am holy. Please put that scripture up for me. But he can't make you because he gave you one of the greatest gifts that he gave to mankind, the power of choice. He can't force you. But he says, be holy as I'm holy. Now, God will not say to you, be holy, if it's not possible for you to be holy. And holiness is not some sanctimonious The English language fills me. It's not some posture. It's not some look on my face. It's not some way that I cock my head at a dangerous angle and, and I hold my hands together like, like, like what? That's not what makes you holy. Being holy is doing as he says. Period. End of story. Being holy is being pleasing to him. God cannot behold sin. When Jesus Christ took your sin upon himself and took my sin upon himself on that cross at Calvary. God turned away from his own son. That's why he cried in agony. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God had to look away. Satan had to have the right to kill him and take him to hell so that you and I don't have to die and we don't have to go to hell. That is the exchange. 
And you cannot, child of God, you, you cannot, you absolutely cannot continue to do despite to the work of the cross. Every time you sin, you are saying the blood is not adequate. Which is a lie. That's why he's seated. It's a man that has finished his work that sits down. God said, sit down at my right hand until I make all those clowns a footstool. The Bible says to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Appear before me properly. Bring the sin offering. And then bring the burnt offering. Jesus was both sin offering and burnt offering. He was sin offering because the Bible says he was counted amongst the transgressor. God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. So that his righteousness can be imputed to us. Come to Romans 5. Glory to Jesus. Romans chapter 5. Let's read from verse 12. Thank you Holy Ghost. Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world. And death as a result of that. Death by sin. So death passed upon all men because of Adam. For all have sinned. Because of the Adam, that Adamic nature. Verse 13 says, For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. So before God wrote down the laws and gave it to Moses, the people did whatever they wanted to do. Cain was jealous of Abel. He killed him. Lamech wasn't satisfied with one woman. He married two. Nimrod decided, let's build a tower to heaven. And they started. And they were going to succeed. Because God said in Genesis 11, He said, go to, let us go down. Because what they have imagined to do, no one can stop them. This was God's testimony. And he had to come down and discomfit their language. So that the building of the tower stopped. Before the law, people did whatever they wanted to do. Because where there is no law, there is no sin. But from the introduction of the law, sin gained a consciousness that man didn't take cognizance of before. He goes on to say in verse 14, Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Because the law came in with Moses. So prior to Moses, man did whatever he wanted to do. And that's where we are, we are in the world today. The world is doing whatever they want to do. I told you, I heard a couple of days ago, people talking about body counts. Asking a woman, a woman, what was her body count? That's not to excuse men, but I can understand if men are like that. You as a woman, how many men are going to climb on top of you? For what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Which is in you? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him, Jesus, that was to come. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, Adam, many be dead, much more the grace, God's power to walk away much more the grace by which one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded to many. To Don, to Bissell, to, to Isabel, to Pierlene, to Laura, to Kemi, to Camilla, 
to Winifred, to Yamilis, to every one of us. That grace abounds towards us. Guys, God's heart is bleeding. I'm telling you the truth. I feel the heart of God. Because of the sin of the church. We've got to clean our act up. So that he can flow freely. In and through us. Look at all the ceremonial cleansing. Just to appear in his presence. But in Christ Jesus. He wrapped all of that requirement. Do this and do that. Don't do this and don't do that. He wrapped everything in one man, Jesus. And sacrificed him. So that you, you can be free. To live for him. What enticement is in the world for you? What? Goes on to say in verse 16, and not as it was, not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one man, Adam, unto condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned by that one man, Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace, that's you and I. We have received an abundance of grace. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You are righteous. If you are in God, you are righteous. If you are in Jesus, you are righteous. Righteousness is not an act. It's not what you do. It is a gift from God. You cannot earn it. That's why he gave it. Much more. They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. Shall reign in life. Shall reign in life. I don't care the challenge. Shall reign in life. I don't care the buffeting. Shall reign in life. I don't care the lack of money. Shall reign in life. I don't care sickness attacks your body. You are supposed to reign. You are designed to reign. Don't keep submitting yourself to the machinations of the devil. That's how he's able to come into your life and mess you up. God will not tell you to stay away from sin if it is beneficial to you. He came to give you abundant life. And if sin is part of abundant life, he won't tell you not to sin. It is not a part of abundant life. That's why it's telling you, don't do it so you can reign. Don't do it so you can have dominion. Don't do it so that your authority is not tainted. Don't do it so that when you speak, heaven gets up. Pastors don't have two heads. I am just as frail as you are. I am just as weak as you are. But in him I live and move and have my being. Completely dependent on him. And when my heart wants to start being funny and looking at man and looking at this and looking at that, I rein it in. I am. I reign it in. No, keep your eyes on God. No, keep your eyes on Jesus. It says you will reign in life by who? By that one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, therefore as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men unto condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one man, Jesus Christ, the free gift Came upon all men unto justification of life. You are justified. 
One man of God said justified, just as if I had never sinned. Justified. That's the meaning. Cleanses you. Just as if I had never sinned. Justified. It goes on to say, For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one man, Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law came into existence. I'm paraphrasing, I'm in King James, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law was introduced so that you can see how simple the human nature of flesh is. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So why do I want to subject myself to thou shalt not, 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 thou shalt not. When I can walk in freedom, in grace. When grace can cover my weaknesses. When grace can give me inner strength and fortitude to walk away. When grace can sustain me. I don't want to struggle with the law. Verse 21 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus. Unless you don't believe these things we're reading. Unless you don't believe the truth of the word of God. Sin should have no dominion on you anymore. Nothing this world has to offer should mean anything to you anymore. And it's not because I'm 65. I've been called since 17. You can live right, even in the midst of the craziness around us. You can. I'm back in Leviticus. Verse 6 says, Aaron should offer his bullock, the sin offering for his own sins and his household, make an atonement. Take the two goats, present them before the Lord, cast lots, because one will be burnt offering unto the Lord, the other will be a scapegoat. That's where that concept of scapegoat comes from, because all of the sin of Aaron and his household, by the laying on of hands, that's why you shouldn't let anybody just lay hands on you for nothing. There is a transference of power or spirits by the laying on of hands. It's a doctrine of the Christian faith. Come to Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 6 chapter 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Leave all the basic things. Leave the kindergarten stuff. Let us go on to perfection. That word perfection means maturity. It doesn't mean perfect as being flawless. F-L-A-W-L-E-S-S. -S. Nobody's flawless. But perfection is maturity. Therefore, leaving the basics, let's become mature. Not laying again the basic foundations. One, the foundation of repentance towards God. Please, give your life to Jesus. Be born again. All right? These are basics. Two, faith towards God. Three, the doctrine of baptisms. Four, the laying on of hands. It's one of the doctrines of the Christian faith because there is a transference by the laying on of hands. And if you let somebody who is not kosher lay hands on you, whatever you get, you get. That's why the Bible even tells us, ministers, lay hands suddenly on no man. I'm back in Leviticus. He will take the two goats, present them before the Lord. He will cast a lot. The one for the Lord, he will sacrifice as a burnt offering. The other one is the uh, scapegoat that's going to carry all of his sins and all of the sins of his household into the wilderness. Psalm 103, God says, I will not remember your sins. 
It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far have I removed your transgression from you. Some of you are still beating yourself over the head with something you did last month, two months ago, five years ago. First John 1 9 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you are feeling guilty about anything, it means it's not settled. Because the enemy is the one who comes to torment with guilt, never the spirit of God. God keep his 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 constant invitation to you is come. Sin and all come. Guilt and all come. But when you find yourself running away from God, running away from the place of prayer, running away from the place of the study of the scriptures, for whatever reasons or excuses you, you, you have, the enemy is somewhere in the picture. God says, come. Just come as you are. But only he can fix that situation. Nobody else. So that goat will be released into the wilderness to carry the sin of that individual away. Just as Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary. To carry the sins of the world away. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. It's out there. It's for everybody in the world. But he says, whosoever, he singles it out. He, 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 what's the word I'm looking? He narrows it down to whosoever. The gift of salvation is for the whole world. But it's whosoever confesses. And if you're in this fellowship, you're not born again. You think you're saved because you go to church, because grandma took you to church. Because you were baptized as an infant, you're not born again. This morning, God told me to ask someone. I began to write it in the chat, but I, 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 I deleted it. If you're not sure that you're born again, call me. We'll pray together to make sure. Like I always say, sleeping in the garage doesn't make you a car. Coming to Bible study every day does not make you a Christian. Going to church every day does not make you a Christian. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 13, that's how you get born again. It says the word is near you, it's in your mouth. That is this word of faith that we preach. That you will, if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you get saved. It's not baptism. It's not catechism. It's not man's doctrine. Verse 13 of that scripture says, you confess with your mouth unto salvation and you believe with your heart unto salvation. And then it says in verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you get saved. So if you're not sure, you need to make assurance double sure. I know that 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 I'm born again. Uh, verse 11 says, Aaron will come before the Lord with the bullock of the sin offering with which he's going to make atonement for himself. Then he will come, verse 12, with a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord with sweet incense beating small and bring it to the very Shekinah presence of God within the veil. Because you know a veil separated the most holy place from the holy place. It was the outer called the inner court and, and the, you know, uh, the most holy. The holy of holies. There was a holy place and then there was the holy of holies and then there was the tabernacle 
of the congregation where all the children of Israel came into. Three compartments. All right? And, and he says, he, he, he will come in with his hands full of sweet incense, beating small, and bring it within the veil. He will put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, so that he, Aaron, will not die. Can you see how in the New Testament we take God for granted and we do whatever we like? Meanwhile, look at all the hoops that even the high priest had to jump through just to be in the presence of God. That's why the day that I was smoking, January 1984, that's why God said to me, how dare you? Your earthly father, can you pop cigarette smoke in his face? And I said, no, Lord. He said, how dare you? Me, almighty God, because I condescend to live on the inside of you. You have the nerve to light up a cigarette. And I said, Lord, till I die. I don't want to struggle. Go and buy the pack of cigarettes, smoke one, and then fill it and, and go and crumple it in the rest. Even as I'm speaking, I'm salivating. He took it away completely. Listen, to the extent you want to follow God, it's to that extent he will reveal himself to you. I'm telling you the truth. If you want a little bitty piece of God, you will get a little bitty piece of God. If your soul is, is clamoring and hungering after him, David said in Psalm 42, as the deer panted for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you. My mind, my will, my emotions dedicated to God by my own free will and choice. How will it then not keep me? God can only keep that which you allow him to keep. If you take yourself away from his mercy, you're on your own. He says, come before my presence with prayer. Incense in the Old Testament typifies prayer in the New Testament. That's why we are a praying fellowship. We, we, we just cannot but pray. A songwriter said, prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. It is the motion of a hidden fire that trembles within the breast. O thou by whom we come to God, the light, the truth, the way, the path of prayer thyself have trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. That's an old Methodist hymn. Prayer is the soul sincere desire, altered on express. It's the motion of a hidden fire. That trembles in the breast. O thou by whom we come to God. The life, the truth, the way. The path of prayer thyself have trod. Lord, teach us how to pray. God is looking for vessels. God is looking for people that he can walk through. He's looking for people that he can use. This world is corrupt and it's dying. It is. Look around you. Look at what is happening. Look at what they're doing to our children. And the law is not protecting us. I read yesterday 
that Michigan, the state of Michigan, is going to start arresting Christians. Jesus said this thing would happen. Why? If you refuse to use pronouns, they will arrest you in Michigan. No nation, no nation has sent more missionaries out than the United States of America. And the fight against America is fight against the gospel. Someone is saying to me, hey, Pastor, yes. No nation, none, has given more money to the gospel than the United States of America. You can't live in which way that you want to. The setting says he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, so that he does not die. He will take off the blood of the bullock, sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. All that ceremonial nonsense wrapped up in blood is not nonsense. But all that ceremonial stuff is wrapped up in Jesus Christ. And he's given to you as a gift. A gift. Then he will kill the goat of the sin offering for the people, bring the blood within the veil, make atonement in the holy place for the children of Israel. He will take the goat that the Lord fell on Goat, verse 22, will bear upon him all the iniquities and he was, he was sent out into the wilderness. They'll find a man that's fit, that can walk far into the wilderness so that he doesn't find his way back into the camp. It's carried away the sin of the children of Israel. He cannot be allowed to come back into the camp. So they find a fit man that will walk only God knows how many days journey, but in, enough so that the goat doesn't find its way back into the camp. After he has done that, he will wash himself with water. <laughs> Praise God. God designates a particular day for the day of atonement. God said it's going to be an everlasting statute. And if you go and read up on uh, the Six-Day War that Israel fought against all of the Arab nations that came together, they made the mistake to attack Israel on the Day of Atonement. Go and read upon it. As a matter of fact, I think there are videos about it. Till today, they cannot explain how a tiny country like Israel dealt with all of the Arab nations that came together against it. I'm like, you guys haven't read your Bible. Verse 29 says, it shall be a statute forever, the seventh month on the tenth day. You will afflict your souls. Do no work at all. Whether you or a stranger within your gates. That day the priest will make atonement for you to cleanse you so that you can be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you and you will afflict your souls by statute forever. Thank God that in Jesus Christ all of these things were fulfilled. And you and I don't have to jump through all of these hoops. That's why we cannot take for granted what it is that we have. It's precious. 
it's precious. I was talking to a dear friend yesterday, and I said, the Bible says, narrow is the gate. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. Wide. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. And then the Bible says, few there be that find it. Few. So you cannot take the things of God for granted. Any questions on this chapter? Any practical application that you can think of? Any comments? Seventeen. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and unto his sons and all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Israel that killeth an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or that killeth it out of the camp, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer an offering unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He had shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. To the end, that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even they, even that they may bring them unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, and offer them for peace, for peace offerings unto the Lord. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and burn the fat for a sweet savour unto the Lord. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils, after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. Thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. But the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. Whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast of fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, the blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Israel, ye shall eat the blood of of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And every soul that eateth that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening, then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Right, this chapter is pretty short compared to the other ones that we have read. God is very specific and definite, and it's applicable, even though it's Old Testament, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. And you and I are one third flesh. First Thessalonians 5:23 says we're tripartite, we're spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. But your body is a third of your makeup. Your spirit, you possess a soul, and you live inside a body. So God says, if you kill a lamb or a goat in the camp or outside the camp, 
it's mandatory that you bring a portion before the Lord as an offering. Now, God is not going to eat cow or goat or sheep. This is God's economy for sustaining his servants. When the children of Israel got into the promised land, he told Moses, he said, do not give the Levites anything. I am their portion. Same thing with all the firstborns. He said, all the firstborns are his. But it was, it was impracticable to, to collect all the firstborns. Where would he put them? So he told the parents to come and redeem every firstborn child. They belong to God. For a male child, bring five shekels. For a female child, bring three shekels. You give it to God so you get to keep that child at home. That firstborn child belongs to God. All the children belong to God, but the, the firstborn has a special covenant with God. And if you're a firstborn child here, you don't understand and you're not taking advantage of what's yours, I'm sorry for you. I wish I was the firstborn. I'll be even more stubborn and, and bolder than I am now. This is God's economy for you to take care of your pastors. I don't like to talk about money. I don't want to talk about money, but I will begin to talk about money because it's necessary. If I don't tell you about it, I'm doing you an injustice. It's the self-same me that teaches on holiness. It's the self-same me that teaches on, 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 on deliverance. It's the self-same me that teaches on healing. Why should I be bashful to teach you about money? You see that because I don't believe that's God's economy? Or I am counting myself to be worth more than I really am? I've got to make myself of no reputation and tell you the truth. And whoever wants to label me, let them label me. But I will teach the full counsel of the word of God. This is how you take care of your pastors. Verse 4, if you don't bring it into the door of the tabernacle, of the congregation to offer an offering in, unto the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord. The blood of the animal that you killed, even though it's your sheep, it's your goat, it's your this and that and the other. That blood will be imputed unto you. You have shed blood that, and that man will be cut off from amongst his people. All right. Same thing with the children of Israel when they bring their sacrifices. A portion has to be dedicated to God. That's why God asks you for your tithe. The tithe is not your money. That's why he says, don't come in my presence without an offering. But because we give electronically now in church, you don't know who's giving. If you want to be prosperous financially, you've got to give. I am a giver. Sometimes I give to my heart. Sometimes I give and I want to kick myself. But I know that that's the principle. When I'm in need, that's when I give the most. Trying to raise the, you know, donation for the trip to Ghana, West Africa. I sold on Sunday. We're not even halfway there yet. Yet I took out of it and I sold. Let God prove his word to me and his people. You either believe God or you don't. There's no midway. There's no strand in the fence. It is fear that makes people withhold. And fear will have you in bondage. I told you many years ago in Staten Island, 93, 94, I was on welfare. And whenever I would want to give in church, Satan would start to remind me of this and that and the other. I had three children, mixed sexes, couldn't pass clothes, had to buy each child's clothes. 
had a girl, a boy, and a girl. The boy couldn't pass close to the girl. The girl couldn't pass close to the boy. The girl was nine years older than the other girl. So she couldn't pass close to her. I had to buy each child's supply. And Satan will remind me, you haven't done this, you haven't done that, this bill, that bill. So I told him, I said, I am employing you as my secretary. Stand there and remind me of all those things. Because once you remind me of it, it becomes my prayer point. Do you know what? He left me alone. I told him, whenever I want to give, maybe I pull out a $20 bill, excited about the service, and he tells me $20. I told him, I said, the next time you talk to me about my offering, I will double it. And I began to do that. Guess what? He left me alone. I took fear out of my life completely by giving radically. Sat down in that house, 494 Elisk Avenue. Sat down in New York, 10303. The bank came to take possession of the house. Because the owner had defaulted on his mortgage. You know your pastor. I said to him, if I want to buy it, what do I need to do? On welfare. I said, well, the one next door, three doors away, we sold for $70,000. It will be about $70,000. It will be about that, that range. This is 1993-94. No, 95. I bought it in 95, July 95. I moved in there in 93. 70,000 on welfare. Cut a long story short. The bank went after my landlord and told him to pay me all of my money because he lost the house in November. Didn't tell me. Kept taking rent from me. November rent, December rent, January rent, February rent, one month security deposit. And all the bank was asking for was 10% down payment. First time home buyer. On welfare, I bought a house. That's why I had to quit welfare. And then my palaver started. Because I didn't have any income anymore. And I had to believe God for every single thing. Multiply 650 by 5. And I was looking for 10% of $5,700. Because that was what the building was appraised for. Went to my bishop. Asked for permission to approach uh, a few families in the, fa in the church to help me. He said, go ahead. You've served well. I spoke to five families. Between them, they gave me $11,478. I will never forget. That's how I bought my first house in this country. And a second one, and a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one, and a sixth one. In this country. An immigrant. What can you not believe God for? What would he do for you? Questions? Comments? Sorry. On mute. Okay, I hear you. Is your microphone on? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. You read some. I read 17. Did I break it down? Was that what I was breaking down? Yes, you just broke down 17. Uh, we start.
All right, it says, to the end that the children of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, and so on and so forth. I was talking to you about God's economy on how to uh, sustain the Levites, the priests. Um, God said to not offer sacrifices to devils. Um, God makes it a statute to them throughout all their generations. He said in verse uh, 8, Whatever man, whether stranger or a Jew, who offers a burnt sacrifice and does not bring a portion to offer it unto the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. So God wants you to bring your offering because that's how your ministers and your pastors are taken care of. Verse 10, he talks about the sanctity of blood. And how important blood is. Blood is usually used to ratify a covenant. Again, I'm going to recommend my book on sex. We're talking about the tabernacle. And I told you God showed me and taught me that the female body is patterned after the Old Testament tabernacle. There's an outer court, there's an inner court, and there's the Holy of Holies. That's why virginity ought to be kept because on the night of the wedding if virginity has been kept the one legitimate designate the husband, the high priest goes beyond the veil which is the hymen in the vagina he penetrates that veil and deflowers his bride that's the parallel sex is holy it's not just something we do because we enjoy it and we love it and it's and it's good. It's the second most awesome gift. The ability to create an entire human. If you have never held your baby in your arms, you don't understand what I'm talking about. The sheer wonder of that life when it comes out of you. And you're looking at it perfect. It's tiny fingers, it's nails, it's, it's hair, it's eyes. All of the organs that you cannot see but are obviously inside. The little heart that's beating, that has been beating from day one. That's why abortion, abortion is... Abortion is murder, simple and straightforward. You that you're supposed to be the chief defender of that life that is within you, you're the one that's going to go and lie down under the scalpel. And have this, this human complete nervous system that can feel pain Get rid of the baby. Get rid of the baby. Get rid. The life of the flesh is in the blood. God said, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. You cannot shed blood anyhow. You can't. You can't. If you miss the mark and you're pregnant, carry it to term and give it up for adoption. It's better than snuffing out that life because you never know who it is that you're carrying. You, you don't know the destiny of that child. You don't know the plan for that child. You don't know why God allowed it. You don't know what answers from heaven that mind is coming with. Blood is very important. 
Thank God that he turned over Roe versus Wade. Talking about my body, my choice. No, the choice was lying down with that man. That was the choice. The consequence of the choice you made is the pregnancy. And that life is not yours to take. You didn't create it. You have no right to terminate it. You know that the consequence of sleeping with a man without contraception is pregnancy. Yet you made the choice. And then you're telling me my body, my choice. Verse 13 says, whoever hunts or catches a beast or fowl, when you cut, it, uh, cut its throat to kill it, to kill, cook it, to eat, you must cover that blood with dust. It is the life of the flesh. You cannot eat blood. I, I, I hear some people bo boil the blood of whatever to eat. I haven't eaten duck. I haven't eaten chicken. I haven't eaten fowl. I haven't eaten uh, pheasant. I haven't eaten uh, uh, cow. I haven't eaten lamb. I haven't eaten uh, uh, whatever it is. It's blood I want to eat. That what? Every soul that eats that which died of itself or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, that person is unclean and he needs to go through the process of cleansing themselves. Again, all of these things were fulfilled in Christ and we thank God for the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God that in him, all of, the, all of these conditions that they had to fulfill, in Christ, everything is fulfilled. Like I always say, it's like it's like uh, I'm arraigned in front of you. You are a judge, and there's a prosecutor that has said this and that, and the other is what Mo did. And this is the penalty under the law. The judge says, "All right, you either go to go to jail for twelve months, or you pay a ten thousand dollar fine. You walk in and you pay that ten thousand dollar fine. That judge has no right to put me in jail." Because you walked in and you paid the fine for me. He must let me go. He cannot take the fine and still throw me in jail. That's double jeopardy. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. He paid the price so that the Father would let us go. If you think about these things, I promise you it will be difficult for you to live in any Silly old way. If you're going to a church where they're not telling you the truth about God, you need to be a reason. Because the church is not a social club. You need to find a place where the word is taught. Otherwise you're fooling yourself. Any questions? Any comments? What was that, Pastor? I, I think um, I. You can hear me now. I'm not yes. sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, earlier this morning. Before you came, well, I saw you, but I was um, reading a book about, um, actually, you have spoken that you liked Kenneth. Like that. Um, but I also had a question, like, and, and because reading reading over this today brought up something that I had done in my childhood. Um, and, you know, I think many people may have, like, you become, like, you prick your finger and you, like, join it with another person. And you, you say you become blood sisters or blood brothers. Um, and for like, for some reason that stirred up in my soul that I was creating a tie to that other person. And that's more like a covenant thing that wasn't supposed to happen. 
Um, so I, I, I know I need to take some time to pray about that and to break those ties, but it's something that, you know, we're like, it, it was an innocent thing to do as a child. We're just, you know, poking our fingers and we're joining together. So I just want to like, if anybody else has done anything like that, just to remember to, to pray about those kind of things. And, um, I'm always wondering why I'm so connected to another person in my past. Um, it's a family you, member, but you don't. You don't have to wait. You can break it right now. Yes. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, the moment the Spirit of God brings it to your remembrance, that's when you, you stop and you break it. It's a covenant. Whether it was done in innocence or not, the devil mm -hmm. is a bastard. Yes. He will take advantage of anyone, no matter the age. Yes. Once the Lord brings such things to your memory, the same words you spoke to establish the covenant is the same words you will speak to break it. Father, Amen. bring to my remembrance everything that I've ever done, especially with my blood, that's contrary to your will and your plans for my life. Whether I remember them or not, Spirit of God, you remember them. I ask you to go back in time. I sever yeah. every time. I break every covenant. Yes. I declare that there's just one covenant in force in my life, and it's the covenant that I have with the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. Amen. Every consequence of those covenants, I cancel. Every yeah. co consequence of any sin that I committed as a result of those covenants, I bring under the blood of Jesus. I judge them. I call them sin. I repent of Amen. them. And I receive your cleansing. Continue your race. Amen. You, you, know, don't, need, I... you, you don't need special study, special time. You spoke it into existence. You cancel it. I canceled it. Yes, I canceled it because I'm, 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 I always have dreams of these family, like this family member, especially this one. Um, she's not in a good place in life. Um, but my dreams over the last couple of weeks have been coming, becoming more and more like, um, I, I want to say demonic, um, because I, I'm having dreams like my children are wanting going to go play in in the water, and somebody's like you know, playing around and saying, Oh, let's just do this little, let, let's just do this little ceremony before you get in the water. And he's like this, this man, it's a man. And he's like pronouncing, um, it's almost like a satanic baptism of sorts. And the kids don't, they don't understand what's going on. So they're just like, let's just go play in the water. And there's this man praying to a demon over the water. And it's just I'm having like really rough dreams like this. Um, and what do you, what do, you do? What What do you do when you wake up from the dream? Um, I I pray. I will. I even wake up my husband and I'm like, hey, we have to pray because there's something going on in my dreams that I I'm not understanding. It's very, it's very cultish. Do you, um, pray, just, do you pray in tongues? I I did not pray in tongues. I I will confess I did not pray in tongues. You should pray in tongues. Yes, ma'am. Yes, because you pray in English, Satan understands English. That is true. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto man, but unto God. No one understands him. Howbeit, he utters mysteries in the spirit. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. Okay. So those things that you don't even have a clear understanding of, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, your spirit man, through the Holy Spirit, He's talking to the Father of all spirits, and you can utter mysteries. You can you can cancel stuff going back fifty years. You can cancel right. stuff going forward a thousand years because your right. spirit is being energized by the Spirit of God to speak accurately concerning whatever it is that you're praying. You you cannot not pray in tongues, especially when you're dealing with demonic things. Yes, ma'am. You have to. Yes, ma'am. And break those things, command them, command those marine spirits, con command them to depart from your dream. And before you sleep, tell God that I refuse any ministration from the realm of the spirit that does not originate with you. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else? Pearlene? Good morning, Pastor Mom. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, hearing um Basil just now reminded me. Vita, she has dreams every now and again, but one that uh stuck out to me, well, two of them. Um, 
And I don't understand why that individual is back in your home. That's all I'm going to say. Anybody else? Abby? Um, since we're sharing dreams, I had this dream the other night that I was at these, I don't, I don't know whose house that was, but I was at their house and it was, I don't know, something, some like witch or something came in and started uh, doing chants and spells and I was praying against it. And I was like, looking at everybody like, why, why is this happening? Like, why are you letting this man do this? And there was like kids and stuff. And then I went outside and there was like trees and woods and stuff. And there was just like black spirit, like talking to me, um, telling me like leave and stuff. And I, and I got in his face and I was just like, um, praying in tongues and like speaking, like I'm a child of God, like I have authority over you and you have to leave and everything. And I was just praying against every spell that this man was putting out in the house and, and then I woke up and I was like, well, that was crazy. Like, so I don't know. I just, I just thought I'd share that because we're talking about dreams. Yeah, you, you took authority in the spirit. I mean, you were you were praying in tongues and you were rebuking the individual. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes God will give you dreams concerning somebody else. It's not necessarily you or your home, but you reacted the right way. You were praying in tongues. You were covering grounds that your mind doesn't understand. First Corinthians 14, 14 says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. My understanding is unfruitful. So you may not understand the things that you were saying, but the fact that you were praying in tongues and you were rebuking this, the, the man and all the spells that he was casting is, is clearly victory. Yeah, I just thought I had never had a dream like that before. And I was like, oh, that was weird. Well, God will use a man that's available, all right? And uh, we've been in a fast for a minute now. And when you're in a fast, your sensitivity is on another level. That's true. That's true. I mean, I'm not a crybaby, not by any stretch of anyone's imagination. But when I begin to fast, I become very weepy. And more sensitive. Bezo, your hand is back up. No, it was just a reminder. Um, you know, you know how we pray Job every day. I feel like there's someone else praying against it. You know, just because we're we're stirring in the spirit every day, we're casting down. You know, we're we're casting down and we're casting away the you know the enemy by doing Job, and it's it's working. But it's making it's getting them upset too, you know. Like they don't want it to work, you know. The, do, those do, demonic do, spirits don't want to hear anything that we got to do say. Do we care? Do we care? No, we sense? don't. But it's just we it's haven't just, even started. It's just crazy how like we're like we're having these dreams and we're we're seeing these things and we're feeling it. Like we're trying, we're starting to feel that in the spirit, and it's just you know we can feel the movement. That's all I wanted to say. Hey Amen. I don't care if he's upset. He said we were in your life, period, end of story. Andrea, God bless you. God bless you too, Pastor Mo, Mama Mo. I love you all. Um, just this conversation just brought to my mind um, what we discussed today in fellowship. Um, there was an analogy used by one of my sisters, my spiritual sisters at, at church. And she said, we are all part of nations. We're not talking about the huge nation, but we're talking about Pastor Mo, you and your entirety, you have a nation. So your children, all of us that are in the fellowship, etc. And each person, myself, we have nations, our children and so forth. And that we must remember that we are in a spiritual battle and in taking the spiritual battle, just like when Moses led them through the Red Sea, at the time when we're walking through at whatever part or position we are, you've got children walking through, you've got elders walking through, you have people maybe in wheelchairs, those that are walking through. And then 
all of a sudden Pharaoh decides what they're getting away. We have to, we have <laughs> to advance. We need to try and take over. Pharaoh and his army then begin to walk through at the same time. But I may be at the other side, but we still have the others that are behind us. So we have to continue to battle and continue to war in the spirit until everybody is clear. And then the sea will envelop everybody behind us. Yep. So I just wanted to share that today because that really, really just reminded me, you know, that it's a continuation. It's not going to be 10 minutes. It's not going to be even maybe 10 months. It's a continual one. So I just wanted to share that. It's going to be till we're after. It's going to be yep, till he absolutely. comes to get us. He said absolutely. men ought always to pray and not to faint. There's no, there's no time or period that you say, okay, I've prayed enough, let me stop. No. No. We're going to pray until he comes to remove us. That's when we stop praying. That's when we don't need prayer anymore. As long as we're on this side of eternity, we need prayer and we must pray. That's how we bring God in on the situation. That's how we co-govern with him and we enforce his will. Thy will be done on earth. It's in the place of prayer that we do that. And that's why we pray. Praise God. Jilda. Great morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to share that I had been having dreams like this for such a long time. And um, it was when I went to a retreat. Well, when we went to the church inauguration um, first, that Sister Angela actually told me, taught me how to pray in my dreams and how to rebuke spirits in my dreams. And I've gotten better at it. And now when these dreams happen, I don't um, like I used to have panic attacks. I used to cry. I used to like just have horrible dreams. And now I've realized that it's not always about me or something that's going to happen to me that if I pray and I pray in tongues, um, that there's that God is using me as a vessel. And just the other day, maybe about two nights ago, I actually had one of these dreams again. And I woke up and I was praying in tongues and I was um, just praying in authority. And it was about violence, the dream about like something happening to a woman. And I prayed for everybody, like in my family. And then I just started to pray for everyone around me. And then when I got really quiet and I was praying in tongues, I actually heard a woman. Like when I woke up, I heard a woman screaming and I started praying in tongues. And I, and I said, if there's someone there, may they walk away. May it like, may it end like God, I pray for peace. And then I started praying in tongues and then it got really quiet. So this woman was screaming as in like having an argument, not like screaming for help or anything like that. Just having like a really loud argument. I don't know with a spouse or whatever. Um, but I just wanted to share that as well, because I've been having a lot of dreams like this. And it's interesting to hear that God will use us as a vessel, not to only pray for ourselves and our families, but for other people around us as well. Yeah. We just got to continue to exercise our God-given authority. We're the ones in charge. We are the ones in charge. And uh, there's no time that we stop praying. We got to keep going until he comes for us. All right. If you don't have any more questions, I think we can bring our study to uh, a close. Is God and tomorrow is um, Thursday. We will pick up from chapter 18. Chapter 18, 19, uh, 20 talks about the relationship, the walk of God's people with Him. Right? Do we have any announcements, Don, Jay? Um, the only announcement we, uh, we have is uh, to continue to make sure everybody uh, gives toward the Ghana mission trip. To the north we say, to the north we speak Job 5.12. God disappoints the devices of the prophet and the of the the hands and not perform the enterprise. Lord, we speak Job 5.12 to the south. 
Lord, we employ the east wind, the wind of destruction. We employ the east wind, the wind of destruction. We destroy every machination against the food that we eat, against the water that we drink. Against the water that we bathe with, against the land that our food is grown in, against medications that don't heal but add to the uh, detriment of our physical bodies, every evil imagination of man's heart, all those that are manipulating the economy of the country, all those that are manipulating our finances, all those that are seeking to control and to hurt us. When you have given us your children liberty, we speak Job 5.12, and we release the East Wind of God to begin to destroy all such institutions in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the East we say, God disciplines the so that the hands not perform their enterprise. And to the West we speak, God disciplines the 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 so that their hands not the enterprise. We thank you for your word. Thank you that it prospers where we have sent it to and accomplishes the purpose for which we sent it out. Give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you tomorrow where we'll continue our study of the book of Leviticus.